Welcome to one of the more obscure Elder Scrolls games, Battlespire. Battlespire was released in the gap between Daggerfall and Morrowind. It's a bit of an important evolutionary step for the franchise, being significant in terms of gameplay, lore, and trends to best put it. Battlespire is vastly different from the main series, however. While it is still an RPG at its core, it foregoes a freedom from Daggerfall to instead put you in a series of extra refined dungeons. While the loss of freedom is a shame, the game can be incredibly focused as a result of all the fat that was cut, so surely it can deliver a proper dungeon diving RPG experience, right? Right? Can I just call this video Underworld Ascendant Part 2? So, quick history lesson. Battlespire was released in 1997. It was originally planned as an expansion to Daggerfall, but it eventually became standalone. Bethesda originally wanted to develop Morrowind in this time period, but fearing that the scope was too great, they instead used the time to focus on spin-offs, and so Battlespire and Redguard were born. These two titles are rather poorly received among most fans of the franchise, though many would agree that they helped form the franchise's identity and establish important story and lore elements. These two titles may have been responsible for Bethesda's near financial ruin leading up to Morrowind. If it wasn't for the success of Morrowind, Bethesda probably wouldn't be around today. These games came out in a rather interesting era for gaming, known for its technological advancements, early 3D technology, and experimental game design philosophies. So Battlespire is certainly an interesting time capsule to look at. Battlespire is the last entry in the series before Todd Howard became a key player at Bethesda. Here he's supposedly only credited as special thanks. I couldn't find his credit anywhere in game, so I'll have to take UESP's word on it. So, what's the story of the game proper? You play as an apprentice battle mage canonically known as the Apprentice. Yeah, very creative. Visiting a training ground known as the Battle Spire as part of your final exam. The Battle Spire itself is a strange lore element to me, as it's effectively a fantasy spaceship. Anyways, when you arrive, you discover it's been completely overrun by Daedra, who are Elder Scrolls equivalent of demons to best put it. You're all alone aside from some rare friendly Daedra and occasional help from your friend, who left important information and resources behind for you. Your friend is later revealed to be captured by Maru Runes Dagon, the Prince of Chains, so stopping the invasion, rescuing your friend, and escaping are your major motivations. There's no prophecy in this game, you're just some random battle maids up against an entire legion and a god, so you're pretty out of element. I'll talk about the story more much later in the level section. I quite like this intro cutscene, not because it's good, gods no, but because it has that distinct 90s feel to it. The mediocre CGI, the color palette, the immediate gore, the awkward title cut in, it's rather delightful. It's a bit like a grimdark bowling alley animation. It also tells you astoundingly little, and most of it is never explained in-game. That's another thing about it that's distinctly 90s. All it needs is some high C ecto cooler and frosted tips, and then it's perfectly 90s. One last thing before I talk about this game itself, the technical stuff. You can easily obtain this game on GOG for 6 bucks. I haven't seen it go on sale for a long time, but it goes as low as a buck fifty. Thankfully it runs out of the box, but it's your DOS box and you may need to tamper with the settings. I have a curse of some sort placed on me, so DOS box is always finicky and crashing no matter what. This game probably crashed on me 5 or so times across a span of 14 hours. There's no source ports or anything like that, DOS box is all you have. If you need to configure it, open a battle page in your GOG library, open a drop down menu at the top right, select additional executables, and then click on graphics mode setup. My settings should be on screen right now. I don't know if they're the best way to experience the game, but they work for me. In addition, I suggest rebinding your keys ASAP. The default control scheme is archaic, but I forgot to document it, so I'll just show my rebound controls on screen. Even this setup has some issues, since my button to fire the bow is the same one as the one to talk to people, so I can easily end up having a conversation on my my arrows are flying. I also must mention a multiplayer component of this game. None of my friends wanted to play it with me for understandable reasons, so I cannot vouch for its quality. There are still means of playing multiplayer though. You can host a server through DOSBox or Hamachi, so the challenge is ultimately finding someone who wants to play with you. <laughs> multiplayer allegedly plays quite a bit differently, as it changes up some skills and removes some spells. No summoning spells in multiplayer for you. I'm also not sure how this game's already weird AI would respond to multiple people, but I imagine it being frustrating. Most people experience this game in single player, so I likely will never mention a multiplayer again throughout this video. We're focusing on the single player experience. So the game opens up with character creation. It's a fairly interesting system to say the least, since you can create some fairly absurd builds with it. It's character creation like this that gives me reason to play RPGs, but modern developers don't want people to have fun with their games. Regardless, it's easy to doom yourself here. Not since System Shock 2 have I seen a character creator where it's so easy to fall into a wrong build. I'd actually say it's far worse than System Shock 2. I'll elaborate on this a little as I go along. This will be a bit of a walkthrough to system combined with some analysis and build suggestions. 
There's not too much advice on internet, so this might help you get the ball rolling if you want to play the game yourself. So you start off by choosing your sex, which just makes some cosmetic differences and switches the sex of your contact throughout the game. Nothing major, but it changes up some dialogue and end cutscene a little. That's about it. Then, you pick your race. One of three man races or one of three elven races, with no option for Khajiit, Argonians, Orcs, or Imperials. Orcs are still monsters at this point in canon, and Imperials don't even exist until Morrowind. The race you pick isn't too huge of a deal in the grand scheme of things, but since stat boosts are rather precious, you still want to pick based on how you plan to build your character. There's no trainers, and the opportunities to grind up your skills are limited, so any boost at all is nice to have. They mix up High Elves and Dark Elves here, hilariously. High Elves are usually the mages and Dark Elves are usually the all-rounders, but not in Battle Spire. The stat boost and description for the races are accurate, but the rest of the descriptions flat out lie to you. For example, the game claims that High Elves have immunity to paralysis, but they actually don't. To rub salt in that wound, paralysis isn't even an effect in the game. So sure, let's say High Elves are so immune to paralysis that it fell out of the game entirely. The descriptions are direct carryovers from Daggerfall, but I guess they forgot to alter them to account for to the fact that they removed racial passives here. Ignore everything but the skill boost. Then, you get to customize your character. The options are limited, but it's much better than Daggerfall or Morrowind character customization. Also, female characters are topless on the screen. Anyways, naturally, I go for goofiness for the most part, but make a vague attempt to create an actual human being for my warrior character. You won't see much of her, because she ended up being a terrible build. If you choose to make a male character, then the chance that it'll look like a sex offender is pretty high. Once you've chosen your race and customized your character, you're thrown into class creation proper. The amount of options you have and things you can do here is a tad overwhelming. You have a limited number of points to distribute across your attributes, skills, starting equipment, and advantages or disadvantages. Reducing stats or taking disadvantages gives you more points to allocate elsewhere. So if you're a peer warrior, you get a good few extra points for choosing to forego magic entirely. You need everything you can get, and you can get some powerful passive abilities. Want to make yourself immune to all forms of magic? Go ahead. Want to pass regenerate health and mana? Sure, why not? Want to be the fastest swimmer of all times? Soul Karen's your oyster. It's not too freeform, but you have more than enough wiggle room to create something wild that caters to your tastes. I must mention that there's a bit of a skill crunch in this game relative to Daggerfall. Yes, the infamous Bethesda skill crunch struck much harder here than it did in Morrowind and future entries. Battlespire is a total of 18 skills compared to the 35 of Daggerfall and even 21 in Oblivion. Despite what you might expect me to say, this was actually largely beneficial. Notably, they cut out all the dubious language skills such as Nymph, Dragonish, and Orcish. In fact, there are no speechcraft skills at all, with dialogue being purely tied to your personality. Medical and Restoration have been merged into one skill, climbing is so absent that even mantling is gone, and things like lockpicking and pickpocket were cut entirely. Oddly, they chose to keep swimming, which is at least a funny novelty because even at a low skill level you swim much faster than you walk. So while the number of skills is much lower than it was previously, they're more focused and useful overall. Only a couple of skills are traps to avoid investing in entirely. I'd say short blade, blunt illusion, and destruction are the worst investments. Swimming is a mixed bag, and I can't really vouch for stealth and back stabbing. Just about everything else is fair game. Arguably, character creation is overall dumbed down in Battle Spire relative to Daggerfall. You don't have access to uber quirky abilities such as spell absorption and darkness or damage from holy places anymore. Probably for good reasons related to the skill crunch and the level design, but it's still a bit of a bummer. Anyone else want to see a modern RPG with a character creator that goes completely bonkers with this kind of stuff? But, as I said before, Battle Spire is a lot of wrong ways to build your character. It is secretly a death trap maliciously designed so that a blind player would get screwed over hours down the line. I have a good bit of advice to give, so buckle in. One of its meanest tricks is your health stat. What do you think modifies your health? If you guessed Endurance, then... How could you be so naive? Why would Endurance affect your health? No, truly the intuitive stat that affects your health is Wounds. Yes, wounds. It affects both the amount of health you start with and how much health you get upon each level up. So, in other words, you put a ton of points into it at the start to become nearly unkillable by the end. You start with 50 wounds by default, which is so comically, ridiculously, profoundly low that sticking with it just might render the game unbeatable. If you want to prove me wrong on that, it's your funeral. You want at least 150 wounds. 200 is the upper limit, which allows you to reach 500 health by the end game. More health is far better than any immunity, 
since immunity to magic isn't actually immunity to magic. More on that later. As unintuitive as it sounds, you really want to take all of the critical weaknesses and dump the points you get from that into your wounds. Physical damage is pretty threatening in this game. Of the 8 attributes, 4 of them are either traps or overly ambiguous. If endurance doesn't affect your health, then what does it do? Well, endurance only modifies how long you can hold your breath underwater. Water does turn into a bit of a death trap with low endurance, but water breathing potions have guaranteed locations, so just hoard those for the very few times you need them. There's maybe only three or so noteworthy underwater sections in the whole game, and the potions last for a long time. Personality is almost useless as well. You can engage in dialogue with enemies and talk them down from time to time, but it's typically better to put your points into health or better stats. In fact, since talking to enemies is a personality check with no consequences for failure, you can just mash the interact button until you get a success, even at 10 personality. I have more to say about personality and dialogue later, but for now, be aware it's not all that useful. Agility boosts hit chance, but I'm not sure how much of a difference it makes. I was certainly hitting less when I decreased it to 10 as an experiment, so I would suggest keeping it closer to its default value. If the hit chance equations for this game are out there, I could not find them. So unfortunately, I can't testify as to exactly how useful it is. Finally, luck seems to be a bit of a trap as well. It supposedly affects everything, but goodness knows what or by how much. I have a hatred for ambiguous stats, so I just reduce it to half and call it a day. So, in short, take points out of endurance, personality, and luck, and avoid major investments into agility. Now, this may sound like joke trick advice you'd find on the internet, like when people suggest you to max out swimming at the start of Deus Ex, but I swear I'm being honest with this. The weapon skill this game favors is hand-to-hand. -hand. Missile slash archery is a close second place in that competition. Hand-to-hand, -hand, or H2H as I'll sometimes refer to it, ignores almost every single downside that regular weapon skills have. It has infinite durability, cannot be disarmed, takes up no inventory space, equips instantaneously, levels quick Quickly and is guaranteed to reach base damage output on par with endgame Daedric weaponry. It's possible to buff the damage output further with Enchanted Gear, of course. In addition, you don't need to choose a starting weapon if you go for hand-to-hand, -hand, so you can spare your skill points for something a lot more valuable instead. You can get a lot of good stuff out of equipment section and character creation, but I'm one to prefer long-term investments over short-term ones. Just don't buy anything too expensive there. 1,000 points for a good starting weapon is an awful investment when you can double your mana for about the same price. I have a bit of a shocker for you. You cannot rest in this game. Interestingly, there's also no stamina and thus no exhaustion in this game either. Since you can't rest, you have fewer current means of healing or regenerating mana by default. You're limited to potions, responding purple crystals, and enchanted gear. And just to be clear, there is no alchemy system in this game. Of course, you can take their generating health or mana advantages into a character creation, but goodness gracious do they regenerate slowly. You need to invest in rapid healing if you don't want to be taking repeated 5 minute breaks after every fight. Regeneration does not scale with your base stats. Early on you can leave to make a Samus and come back with your health fully refilled, but in the late game you'll need to make about 20 Samuses to kill the time. Your alternative to the regeneration advantages is to take the objectively correct route, spell absorption. Spell absorption is an overpowered beast in this game. It's not 100% reliable, it's dependent on your willpower and it will not work if you're at full mana. However, even without major investment, you can consistently turn hostile spells into large amounts of free healing. It's not only reliable protection against spellcasters, but it's also a convenient way of restoring your mana and thus also your health. Spell absorption is a dominant strategy. I'm someone who likes to roll spell absorption in these games in the first place, so I am glad my Morrowind Atronach sign instincts kicked in here. Unless you're foregoing magic entirely, do yourself a favor and take spell absorption. You can choose your spells and character creation. This is a bit of a gamble though, as most spells are niche, extremely pricey, and can be found randomly throughout the game. Emphasis on randomly though. Every worthwhile build needs one spell in particular, Cure Health which is a standard healing spell. It's cheap and almost indispensable for how useful it is. You aren't guaranteed to find a specific spell in your playthrough, so you better take your healing spell and character creation. I have more to say about magic, but it's reserved for the magic section. Here's something vitally important to know. You should modify your attributes before you start to select skills for your class. Why? Well, your skills are limited by the value of their governing attribute. So if your personality is 10, your restoration theoretically should never be able to level beyond 10. 
However, if you reduce your personality to 10 before making restoration one of your skills, you are free to modify your restoration as much as you want. It's such a simple trick that I did it by accident multiple times, so I'm not even sure if it's an oversight or not. Regardless, the cap for skill and character creation is 60, so you can effectively permanently set restoration to be 6 times the level it should be from the get-go at that. Bear in mind that, when you do this, you can never level it beyond what you set it to in character creation. Racial skill boosts are applied after the class, so a Dark Elf with 10 personality can start with 70 restoration. You really don't need to be that high though. Somewhere between 40 to 60 should be adequate, especially fortified maximum mana. I want to leave some things up to you to figure out, so just have a handful of more pro tips before I conclude this section. For one, don't raise Thaumaturgy too much from the get-go. Almost every enemy in the game drops a Sigil Amulet, which raises Thaumaturgy on use. You absolutely must forbid any weapon type that your class does not specialize in. If you're going a pure hand-to-hand -hand warrior, you can forbid every weapon type for a massive amount of extra character points. Yet another upside to hand-to-hand. -to -hand. It's also worthwhile to note that intelligence only governs critical strike and endurance only governs swimming. Intelligence is pretty good for the 1 to 1 mana boost, but also because Critical Strike is genuinely nice to have. Mysticism and Illusion are governed by personality, but they're both almost useless here, so don't worry about them. Teleportation is a Thaumaturgy spell in this game rather than a Mysticism spell. I'd also suggest maxing out Strength as soon as possible, since it governs more than half of all combat skills and increases carry capacity, which is considerably lower than average in this game. One last thing, whenever you finish a level, you level up. That's easy to remember. The points you receive are completely independent of how you play, so no need to grind up your, all your skills so you can increase your attributes by a non-paltry sum or anything like that. The points are static depending on the level, with each level giving you more points than the last to distribute. It's a simple system that lets you play your own way and place your points how you see fit. By the way, even if you put all your points into a specific attribute, you cannot reach 100 in an attribute until level 4 of 7. Spend your points wisely. One of Battlespire's weakest links also happens to be one of the things you engage in the most, combat. Combat is rather simple. You swing your weapon or fire a projectile on an enemy until it eventually dies. Battlespire uses a hit chance system, much like its predecessors in Morrowind, where you have a chance of missing your melee blows at point blank. The hit chance system is something I didn't mind so much in Daggerfall and Morrowind, but here it's a much bigger burden. Hit chance is strongly tied to character progression, with your proficiency in a respective weapon type and stats such as agility, at least allegedly, affecting how often you hit. But oddly, even at 150 hand to hand and 70 agility, I still only landed a probably about half of my attacks. This could be because of the linear progression of the game, so enemy chance to dodge naturally increases as you get further in. Or, in distinctly Bethesda fashion, the calculations could be outright busted. A high dodge skill is actually detrimental in Daggerfall, after all. Whatever the problem is, the combat is strongly reliant on die rolls. And beyond leveling the skill, you don't have many means of alleviating the hit chance issues. I understand Morrowind came out years later, but it gave you means such as bound weapons, training, fortify attack or agility, etc. It also doesn't have interesting means of counteracting combat such as frenzy or levitate spells. Sure, if I want to avoid combat, I could try taking visibility to start and grinding up illusion personality, but... Why? Combat is a source of a majority of loot, and you need to kill certain enemies to acquire things such as keys, which are vital for progression. Everything combined pushes you strongly towards heavily investing in combat attributes and grinding up combat skills. But then, since your hit chance doesn't really seem to increase across the breadth of the game, and it hits its base maximum about the halfway point, the combat loses a sense of natural progression. It's just odd game design. Oh, and so nobody mentions it, yes, you can raise a combat skill to 60 at the start in character creation. However, your combat skills are the ones that will raise the fastest, and it doesn't counteract hit chance remaining relatively stagnant even into the end game. It's also not a great use of points to raise skills so high, with the primary exception being restoration. You have to suck it up for the first couple levels, only for it to then just never get better throughout the latter two thirds of the game. So combat is strongly reliant on die rolls and you don't have much agency over them. Fine. The ideal solution is to put a ton of points into health and go out of your way to grind up your preferred weapon skill. On level 3 there's a ton of Wrathmen who have an astounding amount of health, so you can get them stuck and grind up your skills from there. The AI gets stuck on almost everything. I explained the AI quite a bit in this regard, notably when it came to magical enemies. Magicians will spam explosive projectile spells at you, but very few of them have any resistance to magic. As a result, you can lure one of them to a wall and make it nuke itself to death. 
This is a genuine strategy and a consistently valuable one at that. Magicians will often be standing still in an open space and will still annihilate themselves with their own spells. It's a very literal why are you hitting yourself situation. It just works even on the end game enemies. Speaking of magic, do you remember how I mentioned that immunity of magic isn't actually immunity to magic? Whenever a blow, be it physical or magical, is landed, the recipient gets flung around like a pinball. The knockback in this game is ludicrous, I've never seen it so extreme in a game before, and it's really obnoxious on the final level where you can get blasted into the lava below. Thank the 9 for teleport. Regardless, it's a constant annoyance that takes up the vast majority of combat. The knockback has a quirk to it that you can use to great effect, however. Whenever knockback makes something collide with a physical object, it deals extra damage. This extra damage can be rather high, making it a rather important strategy to try lining up enemies so that you can knock them into walls. It sometimes allows you to one-shot enemies that you normally couldn't one-shot. You can kill an uber scamp in the span of a minute or so if you use this knockback strategy in a good spot. This also applies when a knockback pushes something up a staircase, so naturally my warrior immune to all schools and magic was getting wrecked by spellcasters because this knockback from their spells, which you cannot be immune to, or pushing her up staircases. It's really goofy, and it's one of the ways this game likes to cheat you. At least you can flip the tables with knockback though. Knockback immunity would have been an incredible advantage to have in this game, and maybe certain tougher enemies could have had it too. Even with my comically powerful builds, knockback was a major issue. It's really obnoxious for you as the player, but it also happens to be the most efficient way to kill enemies in a game. Thankfully you can't get knocked back if you whip out your Toho skills and dodge a spell, or absorb it, whichever. And even after all that, I'm still yet to address one of the most fundamental problems with combat. There's another good reason why I think hand-to-hand -hand is the best combat skill in this game, and it's because it works differently from every other weapon type. When you click the punch, you punch instantly. No weirdness, no delay, nothing. Diddly dong. It's as intuitive and simple as it gets. So what about the other weapon types? Well, you need to hold down the attack button and physically swipe your mouse the way you want to attack. Left or right for a swipe, up for a thrust, and down for a downward slash. I have no idea what the differences are here, which checks out. Your screen is completely frozen in place until the attack animation is finished. Assumably this is so that you don't veer all over the place when you try and swipe your mouse to perform an attack. Whatever it is, it's clumsy. You might be able to get used to it, but clumsy controls have always been a sore spot for me. I rebound most of the keys anyways and don't remember what they originally were. This means that punching is a chosen way because it's easier swinging your fists in a blade. I think I get that. The general feel of the combat is analogous to punching pinkies to death in Doom, with a hit chance system slathered on top. It also has exponentially more knockback, worse hit registration, weaker sound effects, clumsier controls, and more. Fundamentally, it's a functional combat system, but it's more RPG than an action game. It wants to emphasize role-playing elements over the player's mechanical skills, so your character's skills take precedence over your own skills. That's fine, but the execution here is blatantly rough. You can cut out some of the clumsiness depending on how you build your character, but there will always be a degree of awkwardness. You can at least counteract some of it by, you know, investing in hand-to-hand. -hand. I'm glad this combat system was greatly refined upon in Morrowind, even if Morrowind was still missing out on features such as a combat log. And don't forget, healing is limited. The game strongly pushes you towards taking something in character creation that lets you easily refill your health. Since enemy hit chance is also random, goodness knows when a random nameless goon will either be a pushover or a substantially greater challenge than Alduin. Potions are relatively heavy in this game and the only recurrent source of healing, if you didn't take any in character creation, is the purple crystals found in static locations that respawn some time after using them. You may need to do a lot of backtracking, standing around, or inventory management between every fight if you didn't spec your character out properly. My warrior character playthrough made it to level 4 before being bled dry by this. If you're spending ages hiding in the corner for health regen, or you're gulping down potions like a subpar Morrowind player with a lot of Sujama, just go back and create a better character. Save yourself some trouble. There's other weird quirks. One of the most significant ones is durability. Durability tends to drain relatively slowly in this game and generally isn't a big deal. You're almost constantly finding upgraded equipment and higher tier equipment is much more durable, so it's only a problem in the early game. However, I must mention that an item's magic charge and durability are one and the same. You also happen to not have any easy way of repairing or recharging your gear. The only means you have is so comically poorly communicated to the point that I didn't even discover it until the end game. The cough for of restoration. These are random, innocuous, empty chests that fully restore one item you place in them before turning back into a regular chest. 
Your only indications that it's a coffer are it being empty and the chest icon saying coffer of restoration when you click on it, which is something I simply never thought to do because it's out of the way. Unless I miss something, you don't even get an indication that these exist in the first place. The Coffer of Restoration perfectly embodies all of the baffling design choices in this game. You're never told about it, it isn't intuitive, you have no agency over it, and it's pointless close to the end game. They're placed in static locations in each level, so they are incredibly limited too. There is a kicker, and it's the also unintuitive fact that you can pick them up and store them in your inventory. Yep, you can just pick up the coffer, stick it in your pocket, and use it whenever you want. Once it's used, it turns into a standard chest and serves all those functions a normal chest would. You can carry it chest around on your person, though beyond some vague inventory management reasons I don't really understand why you'd want to do that. It's already a confusing and disorganized system, so I wouldn't take the risk. Interestingly, this game does not have a fatigue slash stamina mechanic. Battle Spire is a spin-off to a game where you could die of exhaustion, and it's a predecessor to a game where almost everything you do depends on fatigue, so it amuses me in a hard to describe way that is completely absent here. You can also get disarmed, which is more of an annoyance here than anything else. You can't get disarmed if you're already armless, as in unarmed. You also have a secondary weapon, which is just another weapon you can hit a dedicated key to switch to or from any time. It takes a couple thousand years to switch unless you're switching to, what else, hand to hand. It's at least a nice convenience as it saves me the inconvenience of digging through my inventory every time I need my bow, but why not more than two weapons? It's the most primitive item hotkey system there really could possibly be. Finally, if you die, you get a brief cutscene, then you get kicked back to DOS. I don't understand why it doesn't just let you reload a save, but whatever. Heck, even when you beat the game, it just drops you back to DOS like a sack of potatoes. There is a problem, and it's that the first time you save after starting a session, it slightly corrupts your save. Of course, it'll take a while for that to happen, but be on the lookout. Your saves get corrupted much faster on stage 5 in particular. I'll address that in its proper section. Ultimately, the combat isn't great, but at least it's still a league above Oblivion's combat. As we discuss in the character creation section, a stat that may have leapt out to you is personality. It may sound like an odd inclusion given that this game is a combat focused dungeon crawler. There are no merchants present in the game and very few friendly NPCs, so what exactly is the point in personality? Well, you can talk to almost everything in the game. Some enemies will outright refuse conversation, but depending on your dialogue choices, the documents you found, and your personality value, you can bypass encounters entirely and even make major objectives easier. Oh, and you can rail certain enemies. No, really. Between this, the fact that female player characters start off nude and that most female NPCs are topless in dialogue, this is the horniest game in the series for sure. Go to horny jail, Todd. That aside, the dialogue in this game is rather charming in its quirkiness. There's something corny about the voice acting and the writing of the dialogue in general. I rather like it, and I guarantee you the voice actors had some fun with the wild stuff they had to say. Here's the news. We win. Battle Spire is ours. Mages lose. Doornail dead. Just tying up loose ends, and you're the last loose end. Mm. What? What what? Really? Okay, sure. One way back to man world. Big boss Sigil. Catch. Sneaky lying man thing. Sneaks and cheats us, hurts us. Now we catch it. Pull its arms hard. Pop. Help! Help! Man thing! Kill! Kill! Ah! Scared! <laughs> <laughs> Probably half of all the NPCs in this game try to trick you with there being a unique bad ending for trusting the advice of the first friendly NPC in the game, so the game requires some brain cells to complete. You genuinely need to listen to dialogue and read the scrolls to know what to do and how to get the game's good ending, though to be fair, its bad endings are basically just glorified game over screens. On a rather interesting note, the protagonist of Battle Spire, regardless of your build, has the most distinct personality of all the protagonists in the series. They come across as dramatic, ballsy, and humorous to me. A lot of their lines feel rather goofy or awkward, but then a good few lines are threats or long heroic speeches that consistently got a grin out of me. I can't help but like how the writing is simultaneously serious and tongue-in-cheek. The hero of Battle Spire is also the only character in the series with the balls to taunt Maroon's Dagon right in his face. You know, Maroon's Dagon. The guy who's nearly brought about the apocalypse twice in their series now? That's one hell of a likable protagonist in a franchise overwhelmingly composed of emotionless blank slates. By franchise, I mean the serious. I've been in a joke the whole time, I totally know the difference between a serious and a serious. 
one more thing I love about the dialogue is that it conveys a protagonist's progression better than the combat or RPG elements themselves. Stronger and stronger enemies become incrementally more afraid of you as you progress through the game. Scamps will flee at your presence, some enemies will help you instead of attacking you, and even tougher enemies such as seducers will teleport away to escape you if you engage them in dialogue. It gives you a genuine feeling of becoming stronger and more feared as you delve deeper, and it has a bonus effect in making the Daedra feel more believable as enemies. Great stuff, so it's a shame most other games in general don't do anything remotely like this. It always bothered me how, in the other games, freaking Tom Bandit still tries to charge down a Daedric-clad warrior using an iron dagger that may as well be a dull spoon. So, overall, I like the dialogue and writing in this game. Some of it can be rather dry or milquetoast fantasy, but most of it has a good feel to it. I also need to double back and clarify real quick. Personality, the attribute, is still nearly useless. There are some checks that require baseline minimum personality, but these are rare and usually only convince the enemy to fight alongside you. It's never a particularly big deal, so your points are better placed elsewhere. I'm obligated to have a magic section, but there isn't too much to say here, which is why half of this section is ultimately going to be a big tangent. Magic was cut down quite a bit relative to Daggerfall, with only a small selection of spells being obtainable here. Levitation is a notable cut, but basic spells such as fire, frost, and shock damage are absent outside of enchanted gear. It's weird which spells they put in your spellbook and which ones are exclusive to enchantments. To start, you need to be careful with the spells you choose in character creation. Most of them are a horrible use of precious points, but it's also the only way to reliably acquire a specific spell. 800 points for teleportation is steep, but you may never find it if you don't take it then. I think you should have been allowed to buy spells with skill points between levels, but that silly old battle mage biased me why my character would be able to reliably acquire the spells that I want. Beyond that, there's some trouble with how magic is balanced. Destruction is pretty weak, eating up massive amounts of mana for dubious damage output. I couldn't tell if my spells are hitting most of the time. Unless there's a trick to it I didn't figure out, I'd suggest not bothering. Illusion only has invisibility, which isn't all that useful in this game. Yes, Illusion only has one spell, because this franchise loves to consistently shaft Illusion, the most interesting school of magic. Mysticism is nothing but extremely niche buffs that I hardly ever remotely needed, and then Alteration is just incredibly costly spells of ambiguous usage. I'd rather cast more cheap healing spells and cast one costly spell that makes enemies slightly less likely to hit me. So, four of the six schools of magic aren't very good. It's not that they're useless, but the perceived scarcity of mana will push people like me towards exclusively using magic only when necessary, so costly spells that don't get me as much measurable mileage as a healing spell? No thanks. I guess it is a rather boring way of looking at it, but I really did simply gravitate towards casting nothing but healing spells, and sometimes teleport. That being said, that leads us with Restoration and Thaumaturgy. I already addressed that Restoration is incredible in this game. It's your most reliable means of healing. In a game where health is deliberately more limited than usual, it's great to have access to nigh unlimited on-the-fly healing. Thaumaturgy is a bit odd and nowhere near as valuable as Restoration, but it has its uses. Dispel, Etherealness, and Teleport are all nice to have. Monster Summoning is allegedly good, but I didn't get much use out of my experiments with it. I wouldn't advise taking Etherealness in character creation as every sigil amulet gives you Etherealness on the use. That is another upside. Thaumaturgy is pretty easy to level because of the sigil amulets. Also, it'd be really nice if the game told you what the magic icons mean. Like, what do you think this smug woman means? I'll give you a moment. Well, it turns out it's spell resistance. What's this mean? You probably guess frost resistance or something. It actually means fire shield. It just goes on like this. The icons are incredibly unintuitive in general. I guess it's on me for not always paying attention when I chug down potions to raise my skills, but icons that make sense at a quick glance are the point of icons. On a positive note, the game gives you potions to substitute for the majority of spell effects. You can find stuff like invisibility, slow fall, spell reflection, teleport, and so on, all in potion form. Using them also trains up their respective skills. I like these ideas a lot more than the idea that the spells I acquire are up to random chance. There's no alchemy system in this game, but most potion spawns are seemingly static, so they're at least relatively RNG proof in comparison to spells. Moving on, enchanted gear is almost everywhere in Battle Spire. Most enemies have a reasonable chance of dropping something as some sort of enchantment. What the enchantment is, however, is ambiguous and typically up to the player to intuit or find out. It doesn't tell you. It is an interesting idea, and since enchantments tend to be fairly powerful in this game, it is worth exploring. Enchanted gear is heavily randomized, so you need to pray to your favorite luck god that you'll find what you want. Anyone but Nocturnal though, cause she's the worst prince. 
I need to go on a bit of a side here following from what I've talked about in this segment up to this point. So you have a limited control over your spells and what enchanted gear you can acquire. This poses a problem. Just because you build a hand-to-hand -hand character doesn't mean you're likely to find gear appropriate for a hand-to-hand -hand character. You see the issue? Loot is overwhelmingly randomized. There is no way of knowing what an enemy will drop and since the loot tables don't seem to care too much for the tier of the enemy nor your own stats, you'll get random junk at all points in the game. Plus, you obviously can't loot enemies who aren't dead so personal personality is even more useless than I originally made it out to be. You want those combat skills, otherwise you're just Mr. Magoo stumbling through the battle with some. There's a genuine chance you might never find an item of your preferred weapon class that's better than Mithril. While that's not awful, Darren's output is important, so you naturally want the best of the best, Daedric material. Here's the thing, I tried to keep in tally of the Daedric gear I saw. I found two long swords, one bow, and one crossbow. Now, the problem isn't that Daedric is rare, it's that I never found any Daedric axes, maces, or short swords. Three of the five major weapon types never showed up in Daedric quality. That's another reason I recommend hand to hand, you can guarantee yourself 16 to 18 points of damage per strike, which is considerably better than that of a Daedric short sword and equivalent to the lower damage ratings of a Daedric Claymore. Even artifacts such as the Savior's Hide and Spear Bitter Mercy are subject to the same random material system. So in rather hilarious fashion, the Spear Bitter Mercy, ostensibly a legendary artifact, might just be an incredibly pitiful iron spear. In short, Fist can ignore the inherent luck factor of the other weapon categories. If it's not clear by this point, I love fists and fisting uh, in the Elder Scrolls Legends Battle Spire. So, in short, Battle Spire tends to not really give you what you want. It's the kind of cucking that happens in roguelikes or looter shooters. Now, this isn't to say RNG is a bad thing, I do like a degree of randomness in my games. The problem is, in an RPG, I want to build a character. If my axe character can't find a good axe, I almost have to wonder what the point is. So while the RNG isn't necessarily game-breaking, it still means that an unlucky player ends up being gimped in the long run. You'll miss out on spells, enchantments, good armor and weapons, and so on. All because you have no control over the loot you find. It's another system that's blatantly undercooked. Leading in from the loot, I guess this is the perfect time to address the UI. It is abysmal. I thought Oblivion and Daggerfall were bad about this, but this is a whole nother level of awful. Daggerfall's UI was bad, but it was at least easy to look at, intuitive, and fairly responsive. Weirdly, this series does have a bit of a curve with its UI. Morrowind's UI is some of my favorite of any game ever, but I have to wonder if it was a fluke at this point. You click one button and a massive swath of important information is presented to you in a clean, understandable, and customizable way. Here, the game sections out your inventory and some of your base stats on two separate screens, but there's a lot of weird things going on here. Why is your hand-to-hand -hand damage only listed in the inventory and not on your character sheet? How come your character sheet is the only way you know your exact health at a given time? Why is your inventory not listed your encumbrance? These are mostly minor problems, but buckle up for things about to get so much worse. I'll give you a moment to put on your buckle since it's probably at the bottom of your colossal vertical column of an inventory. This vertical column design for the inventory? Staggeringly terrible. There's typically two columns to your inventory at any given time, no matter how you access it. The one on the left is your own inventory, and the one on the right is whatever's lying on the floor near you. It represents the lone armor piece on the ground, the bag left behind by the dead scamp, or whatever's in the Mickey D trash bin out back. Because of the vertical column design, only so much can be shown at a time. There's no way to customize it or expand it. Hey, me from the future here. The tabs at the top are filters, so if you click on potions, it filters potions out of your inventory. Why not have it so that clicking on the potions tab, I don't know, just shows me nothing but potions? Four slots of your inventory and four off the ground at a time are all you'll ever get. Good luck organizing your inventory at all. Unless you go out of your way to keep them at the top, your health and mana potions will rapidly sink towards the bottom of your inventory. In addition, whenever you unequip armor or weapon, it sinks all the way to the bottom. Later on in any individual level, your inventory will likely be cluttered from picking up important items and keys. As a result, the later you are into a level, the longer it will take to reach your health or mana potions. The UI isn't in real time, so it's not too big of a deal, but it's an extreme inconvenience. With no way to automatically sort your inventory or hotkey items, it's up to you to sort it manually, or you could just be more like me and begrudgingly accept the tower of trash you'll accumulate. And another problem is glaringly obvious here. What is the point of these top two boxes? Sure, one indicates your inventory and the other indicates what you're searching, but 
Do you really need this? Two slots permanently sacrificed from the UI for this. There are a good few times in this game where I would have genuinely appreciated a fifth visible slot at any given moment. I missed out on items from time to time because of this. And on top of all of that, why does the player character have to occupy so much of the screen? It isn't pointless as it's a primary way to equip and unequip armor, but it's still an inefficient use of a large amount of real estate on the screen. Real estate that could have been used for an actual functional inventory. What were they thinking? But it doesn't end there. All items of a specific category will have the exact same inventory icon. All potions look identical for instance. Can you tell what kind of potions these are by just looking? The same goes for axes, bows, gems, boots, daggers, capes, crossbows, spears, javelins, arrows, shirts, lusty Argonian maid books, scrolls, spell tomes, maid- Okay, you get my point. There is no distinguishing two items of the same class on a mere glance. You will always need to click on an item to know what it is. Now, I can get past that since I inspect almost everything I find in loot, but this does have a specific obnoxious gameplay consequence. Almost every enemy in this game drops an item called the Sigil Amulet, which does have numerous forms, but all of them serve the same general purpose. They're not actually amulets in a traditional sense, they just cast a temporary ethereality spell and vanish on use. You gain some thaumaturgy experience from doing this, but the average player might use these once, not understand what they do, and then stop inspecting or at least taking them. Well, the developers play on this in a rather cruel way. Meet the Sigil Amulets of Entry. These are vital to completing the game, but can easily be missed by a first-time player. These allow you into story pivotal locations or, on rare occasions, small little side areas with some bonus loot. The problem is that they are visually identical to every other Sigil Amulet, so if you don't know they're a thing, you can easily miss out on one and have to backtrack across the map to find it. I feel like it would have taken no effort at all to recolor these to be green or something, but the developers probably shot that idea down because it would be convenient for the player. You have to always be on guard because any sigil amulet dropped by nearly any enemy in the game has a chance to be vital for progression. Not helped by any of this is the fact that enchantments on magical items are ambiguous. I get the idea here, or at least what I think the idea was. It's to encourage the player to learn by experimentations, observing patterns, and reading the scrolls that document magical enchantments. I find it more annoying than anything else in a lot of cases, and it served as a deterrent from enchanted gear, despite the fact that enchantments can be powerful. I know I said before that enchanted gear was worth looking at, but I ultimately skipped over probably half of all enchanted gear because things like Sanguine, Golden Wisdom, or Craven, Knave, and Jack will mean nothing to me. And I dislike the UI to the point where mild inconveniences like having to test out an enchanted item were major turnoffs. There are even a good few enchanted items that have downsides or are purely harmful to the players, so there's always a risk factor to trying them out. There's an entire page on the UESP wiki devoted to enchantments in this game, and a lot of the entries are still ambiguous. I'd highly recommend consulting that over the in-game sources, because a lot of things are not revealed to the player, and a good few of these documents are on the penultimate level of the game. On a rather funky note, you can get weapons that boost your stats and other weapon types entirely. I found a mace that boosted hand to hand once, so there's at least an amusing meme factor to the system if nothing else. Since I'm talking about presentation, I should quickly address the visuals. They're pretty standard for a 1997 PC game. There's more emphasis on sprites in this game than most other games of the era. Allegedly, this is because the art designer preferred the higher level of detail you can get with sprite work rather than th primitive 3D models. It was probably a performance compromise as well, as you couldn't cram as many 3D models into a level as you could 2D sprites. Of course, there's still a good bit of actual 3D models here, but they opted for sprites for the enemies. Soul Karen's come a long way. The 2D visuals are quite well done. The monsters look great, the textures are generally fitting and unique per level, and the player character looks pretty good. The monsters have identifiable silhouettes that help you in identifying them from far away, though the late game Dremora are exceptions. I'm also surprised by the number of customization options for the player character. This game is exclusively first person, but I guess you do see your character whenever you pop open your inventory, so maybe that's why they put the extra effort in there. As far as I can tell, your face doesn't change your sprite in multiplayer. Only you can see it. Since the sprite work on the faces is decent, you don't have a potato faced abomination taking up half of the inventory menu at all times. That would be stupid. What kind of developer would let that be a thing?
That aside, the graphics are obviously a little dated by today's standards. I'm not the best gauge of relative graphical quality, so I can't say if it was particularly good for the time. Pixels are blatantly visible, most 3D models are primitive, weapons don't have unique models based on their material, and the fog is nigh bad breath distance away from you. People complain about the fog in Morrowind, but nobody complains about the fog in Battlespire because they've never played it. It's especially funny how, with the right stats and enchanted gear, you can jump right to the edge of the fog. So Battlespire didn't age all that well in terms of technical visuals, but it has good art direction, a unique palette for every level, and charm to match. I think that's all far more timeless than any technical graphics. The game's sound design is generally passable. There's nothing wrong with most of it, but I wouldn't call any of it particularly good. Sounds are distinct and functional. The game makes it clear when you miss entirely and when your enemy stops your blow, which is something this game admittedly has over Morrowind. Enemies have distinct callouts and unique dialogue per species. Some recurrent enemies will have different dialogue in each level, which is nice. The biggest problems with the sound design are immediately apparent, though. No. I'm talking like less than 60 seconds into actual gameplay levels of immediate apparency. Just have a taste. Girly? Girly gone, flesh bit. So whenever enemies try to perform an attack, they'll play a sound, usually that scratching sound. If you try kiting them, they'll repeatedly attack you, only to be instantly pulled out of it by your movement. As a result, enemies can be turned into cacophonies of horrific scratching noises. It's like Beethoven if all he had was nails and a chalkboard. There's something inherently rather terrifying about being charged down by 2D sprites, and this certainly does not help. But the other issue is the music. The music is generally ambient, stuff that's rather fitting for a dungeon diving adventure. Each level has its own unique ambient track. It's mostly alright, and some levels have some genuinely good ambience. There's a handful of issues I have, however. I think most of these tracks are about two to three minutes a pop with minimal breaks. Since you'll likely spend an hour or two in each dungeon, you're gonna hear a lot of the same track. The volume slider doesn't work at all, too. I wanted to turn it down to halfway, but it's perpetually stuck at max volume. I looked in DOSBox's settings and tampered with the audio slider a ton, and everything I tried being to no avail. This is fairly loud music, so I guess the only way to evade it is to mute the game altogether. That's why I've muted the audio in most of my clips, since I figured you wouldn't want to be hearing loud ambient tracks the whole time. There's also a brief moment of silence between loops, which became a period of respite for me now and then. There's also a bit of misfortune going on here. It is currently unknown who composed this soundtrack. As far as I can tell, whoever it is hasn't come forth with verifiable proof of identity in the 20 years this game has been out. It's not Eric Haberling, and it's certainly not Jeremy Soule either. The most I could get is that there is likely someone who worked at Absolute Pitch, an audio studio located in Bethesda, Maryland, back in 1997. Maybe someone out there can solve this mystery, but with my luck doing research, it won't be me. Now we move on to levels, but this is ultimately going to be an abridged walkthrough the entire game. There are 7 levels in total, but you can argue 8 since level 2 is split into 2 halves by a point of no return. Each of these levels will probably take you 1-2 to two hours on average for a roughly 10 or so hour long experience. I'd say you should expect to play time under 15 hours, depending on your build and how explorative you are. There are a handful of commonalities across all of the level design in the game, primarily the glorified key focus design a la the original Doom. The sigil amulets of entry overwhelmingly serve this purpose, but sometimes other items serve as progression gates. Notably, one mission requires you to collect seven items before you can complete one objective. Objectives are usually pretty simple, and the game does a good job communicating them to a literate player. I didn't need walkthroughs often, and a few times I did were because of the rare obnoxious puzzle, scavenger hunt, or missed item. If you don't loot everything, chances are you'll do a lot of retracing your steps eventually. The biggest problem I have overall, as I'll discuss, is the scavenger hunts. Almost every level is a scavenger hunt, usually for items you won't immediately understand 
understand the use of. I hope you're to sort to go secret hunting in boomer shooters because a lot of vital items are hidden in what would be secrets in almost any other game. Before I talk about the first level proper, I'll quickly reiterate the story with some extra details. Battlespire takes place during the events of Arena, the first game in the series. For whatever reason, the Imperial Emperor, Jaegar Tharn, promised Maroon's Dagon to Battlespire, so in typical Maroon's Dagon fashion, he invades it and slaughters everyone. The protagonist, known cleverly as the Apprentice, is an Imperial battle mage effectively under final exam with their partner. When they arrive, they find that everyone is dead and their partner is in trouble. So it's up to this lone apprentice to rescue their partner, escape the battle spire, and stop Dagon. The first level is the Weir Gate. Don't forget to save first thing, or else you'll lose your character if you die. If you walk forward immediately, you'll die in hilarious lava engulfment fashion. The game immediately teaches you about the ability to talk to enemies, but at least you find out things from there. I have a certain level of respect for games that just throw you in there like this. Battlespire does not have a true tutorial, which it's nice for a more short form game where you can screw yourself as early as character creation. The Weird Gate isn't too hard of a starting level and I imagine you can get past it with a mediocre build. The game doesn't really gatekeep your build on the Weird Gate. Think about that for a second. It can be a little hard at first, but once you get some gear and level your skills, it tapers off quite a bit. This level is a massive multi-layer scavenger hunt in a highly interconnected level. This is one of my favorite areas in the entire series because it's a genuinely good dungeon crawl. You need to find an entry to the Star Galley, 5 cogs, and you need to shut all the anchors that keep Battlespire tethered to Tamriel. If you open all the anchors, you get an alternative ending where the whole place is sent to the Shadow Realm. That's why I don't trust wizards hiding behind filing cabinets. Level 1 is also the only level in the game with less than 100 enemies in total, just so you can be aware of how much combat there is in this game. The second level is Administration. This level is weird in that it's split into two parts, where you're unable to return to the first area after completing its objectives. There's a marked difficulty spike in this level due to the inclusion of the Spider Daedra, who are easily some of the most dangerous enemies in the game. They have a lot of HP, hit like a truck, and tend to poison you with their spells. Cure Poison is pretty rare, but these are the only enemies in the game that poison you, at least as far as I'm aware. This is also the only level they appear in. Love their dialogue, at least. This is a level that'll gatekeep your build. My original Warrior playthrough almost ended here because of how much time I had to waste waiting for my health to slowly regenerate after being poisoned. Yeah, don't forget to take rapid healing. This level is primarily about assembling pieces of a void guide, which is some gizmo that the game never really explains, and I couldn't find any lore discussions on it. Scourge makes an appearance on this level, but you have to give it a Wait to some weird water woman. How it ends up in Deviath Fire's possession in Morrowind is beyond me. Wait, how do you pronounce his name? This level has a large number of riddles, which rarely show up after this level and the next. Thankfully, there's a scroll with the answers to most of the riddles within halitosis distance from them. Naturally, since I'm me, I walked right past it at first and solved half of the riddles on my own. There is a funny disconnect in this regard, since my 10 intelligence warriors shouldn't have been able to have figured any of these riddles out on her own. The design of the first half of this level is circular and oddly confusing for me. It's one of those things where you get lost but don't understand why. The second half is also rather small and it branches off into linear passageways quickly. This one doesn't do it for me quite like the first level did. But level 3 is a soul cairn. Yes, it's the same place you visit in Skyrim. Hilariously, it's actually a lot easier to navigate here than in Dawnguard, so the Sky Babies have it harder for once. It's another good level with a handful of quirks and new additions that make it refreshing in comparison to previous levels. It has some decent variety and is quite reasonable in terms of difficulty, though maybe it's a bit on the easier side. The ambience here is the best in the game, and I like the muted blue and grays of the color scheme. Your goal here is to simply find a teleporter in Nocturnal's realm, Shade Perilous, and reassemble it. Hey, it's me from the future feature here again. Nocturnal's Realm is the Evergloam. Shade Perilous is just a pocket dimension of it. If you already left a comment, then you disgust me, you lore beard. It's one of the more linear dungeons of this game, though that's not to say it doesn't have any branching paths or anything like that. There's plenty of stuff to explore, and you can even talk to the ideal masters, though you don't really get anything out of it. A fun feature of this level is the Wrathmen. These guys have a ludicrous amount of HP that borders on invincibility. You can use them to grind up your weapon skills, which you really ought to. You can find a scroll featuring a poem you can recite to purge them, though it usually takes a couple tries for whatever reason. Assumedly, it's a poem they wrote in middle school, making it weaponized cringe. Overall, a fun dungeon crawl, but it has some of the most cryptic BS in the game in it. Don't forget about the valves just randomly placed in a corner in the middle of the eastern swimming pool, or maybe the single plaque that tells you answers to the riddles in the middle of a room with about a hundred other identical plaques. It's also the first level in the game to feature water. Here's a fun quirk. If you're at two-thirds carry capacity, you sink to the bottom. If you have low endurance, you'll die in about 5 seconds. If I wanted to be cheap shotted like that, I'd be playing Doom Wads. 
I guess it's a good time to address the platforming. I find I tend to be an extreme minority with a good few of my opinions, and my hatred for non-first person platforming is one of those opinions. Battlespire's platforming is, in theory, good. You hold down the spacebar to charge your jump. A 3D Dorito pops out of your crotch in the meantime, and it indicates where you'll land when you jump. It adjusts rapidly in real time, accounting for the player having a ludicrous jump skill or athletics enhancements, which is fantastic. Jump is genuinely rather important to have. It's one of the fastest ways to get around, and a high jump skill even lets you skip certain segments entirely. So what's the problem with the platforming? Well, this game's absolutely atrocious. Collision physics are the problem. There's no mantling or climbing in this game. They are cut out for whatever reason. Imperial Legion members born before 3rd Era 375 can't mantle. All they know is McDagons, charge the armbands, fist, be spider sexual, and lie. Back to what I was saying, whenever you barely whiff a jump, you get stuck on a geometry. I'm not joking. You can easily softlock yourself in platforming sections or on elevators or even just getting out of water. If you so much as grades a sharp edge in your jump, the chances of softlock are high. Whenever you approach a ledge, your character becomes incredibly sheepish and starts ignoring movement key presses. I want to tap my way off an edge, but I'm also only allowed to make extreme movements off of them. As a result, it's completely effortless to get wedged in something like an elevator resulting in a softlock. Or maybe you'll fall much further than you want to down a multi-level shaft. Hope you saved recently or you have access to teleportation. Alternatively, maybe your speed is so high that you can't properly do maneuvers that should otherwise be brainless. There's also this weird sideways pushing force applied to your controls in certain sections which doesn't help at all. Platforming has come up numerous times throughout the game up to this point, but the Soul Cairn has one of the nastiest sections in the whole game. It looks simple, but trust me, these three platforms are the secret final boss. Also, in order to activate one of these platforms, you need to activate that aforementioned hidden valve in the corner of the underwater area. Blow off, I hate that kind of stuff. There are at least some ways to help trivialize some platforming sections. Taking athleticism at the start is one way, and I would recommend it if you have a decent handful of skill points to spare. You can also equip or use something that fortifies your jump skill. Wood Elves also get a plus 15 bonus to jump, so keep some potions to jump around, just in case. Stage 4 is Shade Perilous, which marks a ludicrous difficulty spike. Shade Perilous is one of the few times Nocturnal's realm has been depicted in the series. Appropriately, most of the enemies here resemble Succubi, but it also introduces Fire and Frost Daedra. Low-tier popcorn enemies like Scamps and Skeletons are completely absent here, with almost every enemy present being able to kill a weaker player very easily. The worst of all are the Dark Seducers who, despite primarily being magicians, can still utterly wreck a character immune to almost all forms of magic. They're the hardest enemies in a game thanks to their incredibly high stats, frequent placement, erratic movement, and dangerous spells. This is where my Red Guard Warrior playthrough ended, which was my first playthrough effectively. This level was so much harder than the Soul Cairn that I had to have saved scum to kill singular enemies. Turns out, being immune to fire doesn't mean that fire danger can't turn you into spit roast. I was going through health potions at an alarming rate, with no idea of how much I needed to conserve them. The hordes of Dark Seducers are relentless, with numerous of them, the hardest enemy in the game by far up to this point, being crammed into singular rooms. This level was a lot easier for my hand-to-hand -hand restoration and spell absorption character, but I still wouldn't underestimate it if I were you. I hate this level, even ignoring its brutal character-ending difficulty spike. A large chunk of it is water, bland corridors, and backtracking. You get a boat you can drive on the water, but it's mind-blowingly slow and it's vulnerable to bombardment from above. The level is massive, but it's massive in the same way you hunt down the Freeman level is massive. It's not, it's half empty. This level is technically important in terms of story, but I have almost nothing to say, mostly because I can't show much of it due to every character being a nude succubus. It's some weird drama involving a goth emo succubus chick you have to befriend. I think she's supposed to reappear later in the game, but I never saw her, so I guess it ultimately means nothing? I don't know. Let's move on from the worst level to one of the best levels. Next up we have the Chimera of Desolation, which sounds like the name of a metal band. This is a unique level, a bit reminiscent of the later Black Reach, which is unironically a good level so don't take that as an insult. It's an open area with a bunch of sub-areas inside of it. You need to explore most of this level since it's another massive multi-layer scavenger hunt. It's a tough level overall, but it's more reasonable, open-ended, and generous than Shade Perilous was. If you are able to get past Shade Perilous without exhausting most of your resources, you should be able to handle this. Here's what no other reviewer will mention about this level. It has a fully functional hot air balloon you can pilot. What are the lower implications of this? You're being pursued by groups of Flame Daedra, Frost Daedra, and Hernies. The Hernies are unique to Battlespire, and, in this level, they're invincible unless you strike them with the Spear of Bitter Mercy. You need to find 5 keys, 6 pieces of Savior's Hide, and the Spear of Bitter Mercy. With that, you must kill the leading Hernie, and then you can escape. 
This is a bit of a sadistic scavenger hunt, as they hid some of the pieces in obnoxious places. Notably, the curious is quite literally right below where you start the level, underneath the dock. You're welcome for that pro tip, because I needed to Google it. This level also has one of the most fleshed out NPCs in the entire game. Old Man Shamer here, who tricked and defeated Dagon a good while back before the events of Battlespire, has some tasks for you to do, such as finding his spoon. He's the only way he can acquire the Spear of Bitter Mercy, so you better do as he asks. I almost wonder if he's part of the reason why the Spear of Bitter Mercy was a reward for Shea Gorath's quest in Morwen, despite being a Hercene artifact. Also, a document written by Chimere alleges that the Savior's hide is a Malakath artifact. Make of that what you will, since we'll likely never get a clear answer to this. Elder Scrolls is a series that loves playing with the idea of the unreliable narrator, so it's ultimately unclear which of them actually created it. Oh, and this level introduces the idea of the protonymic and neonymic. Apparently, Dagon has multiple names and saying them weakens him. I don't think any other entry in the series ever really touches this idea again. There's some vague nods to it here and there in the later titles, but that's it. This level has one big issue, and it's certainly not an intentional design choice. In the most recent patch of this game, your saves in this level get corrupted at a much more rapid rate than any other level. Allegedly, your first save in a play session gets very slightly corrupted, saving a bit of garbage data. Level 5 saves substantially more garbage data than any other level, so you need to avoid anything that could kick you back to DOS, like death. You can safely save multiple times per session, but you may want to back up your saves if it makes you paranoid. I'm going to stop for a moment and say that there are late game spoilers from here on out. There are two dungeons left to cover. I understand some people may still want to experience this stuff relatively blind, and I will be showing the ending. If you don't want those spoilers, just skip to the timestamp on screen. Are you good? Alrighty. The penultimate level is Havoc Wellhead, which is another pretty killer band name. I actually don't have too much to say about this level overall. It's one of the most linear dungeons in the game, and it has more backtracking than average. It's not much harder than the Chimera Desolation, but it does feature some tough enemies. Daedra Lords are introduced here, who utilize this obnoxious continuous damage spell that they can stack on you. At this point, the game starts to get incredibly generous with resources. Enemies frequently drop high tier armor, Daedric arrows are everywhere, and you'll just find piles upon piles of tier health potions. Also, this the segment at the start is stupid. You have to get past a gate by knocking over a tree? This is the first of two times this comes up. If you've seen my earlier videos, you'll know I've nicknamed garbage like these AEPs, short for Awful Environmental Puzzles. It meets all the criteria to be an AEP. It fails to establish itself, it isn't something the game hints you can do, and it makes no intuitive sense. My lawyer says if I don't make callbacks to myself, I won't be relevant. Uh, the music is good, I guess. There's some Clan War stuff going on in the level, and you need to negotiate with some pretty friendly guy for Dagon's Neonimic. That's about it. And the final level is Dagon's Hunting Lodge, sometimes known as Dagon's Pleasure Palace. This level is outright linear, most of it is a single linear path to your objective. The whole level is over lava, which you can escape if you fall in, but the assault on your ears just isn't worth it. Make a teleport anchor on land and warp away to instant your helplessly careening into the spicy water below. This level is overall quite reminiscent of the Deadlands from Oblivion, which is fitting, or, well, Oblivion is reminiscent of Battlespire. I mean, be honest with me, which did you play first, Battlespire or Oblivion? Anyways, this level has a weird gimmick to it, and it's that there's a bunch of artifacts on the ghosts here. The scroll you find at the start of the level tells you what they are. My personal favorite are the Boots of Peace, which give you plus 50 to hand to hand, but prevent you from equipping other weapons. Downside being redundant aside, that plus 50 makes a world of difference. You're up against hordes of Daedra Lords and a new Daedra Counts, who are very dangerous. There's a huge battle close to the end of the level that has about a dozen of them in total. This level feels like you're pushing through a desperate last line of defense, and I get a kick out of that. Once you kill a couple dozen Daedra Major lords and get through the palace, you must face Dagon himself. Be sure to equip the Savior's Hide in Moonreaver. You did snatch Moonreaver, right? And you kept the Savior's Hide from level 5, right? Oh, wait. If you dropped it earlier, ghost this before Dagon gives you a full setback. That's some unexpected generosity for the player doing something outright dumb. Also, don't worry about being unable to equip the sword. Even if you forbade Longblade and character creation, you can still use Moonreaver. In a fit of actual good game design, you can't make the game unbeatable because of a specific random choice you made in character creation. Dagon will converse with you, and it's one of my favorite conversations in the game. This is the first time in the series where you get to listen to a voice Daedric Prince talk very slowly at you, so that's a punch battle spot beat the rest of the games too. I can't help but like the fact that basically everything goes wrong for Dagon here. Savior's hide counters his paralysis magic, his neonymic and protonymic weaken him, and a surprise attack with Moonreaver all combine to smite his Kroger brand devil arse. You get a pretty long CGI cutscene as a treat, which I can't show too much of because of the visible milkers. Why does this keep happening? It's the third game on my channel in a row.
And that's it. No credits. Crash back to DOS. We don't get to know what happens to Battlespire's protagonist or their partner after the fact. At least the climax was a spectacle though. I don't think our apprentice is really gonna get a good ending though. Level 5, the Chimera of Desolation, was created because of how angry Dagon was at Old Man and Chimera. In an act of revenge, Dagon catapulted Chimera's home island into oblivion. What's to stop Dagon from coming back and doing something similar to the apprentice? Now, it is mentioned that Chimera made a pact with Dagon, where Dagon then twisted the words of the pact to screw Chimera over. But a pact doesn't mean Dagon won't still screw with the apprentice. A lack of a pact doesn't stop this princess from screwing with you, obviously. Even back in Daggerfall, Nocturnal would send her hit squad of Frost Daedra after you you didn't do exactly what she told you to do. So yeah, the apprentice would be in a pretty unenviable position after defeating Dagon. Battlespire's story ultimately doesn't have too much relevance in the long run of the series. The most noteworthy mentions of the events of the game in the series are in the book Doors of Oblivion, which is a conjuration skill book, and basically all it says is that Battlespire was destroyed, an entire game's events relegated to a throwaway line in a random book. But that's not to say Battlespires are relevant to the series as a whole. It established a good bit of important lore and artifacts for one. The princes other than Sheogorath didn't have too much characterization at this point. So Battlespire is the writers exploring Maroon's Dagon and a bit of her scene. A handful of the places in this game appear again later on and a lot of the Daedra varieties also became recurrent. Oddly, a lot of the artifacts from this game reappear in one place in Morrowind. Scourge, the Savior's Hide, and the Daedric Crescent are all present in Telfire. Evidently, just because the Viathfire, I don't even remember how I pronounced it, uh, was the only person in all of Tamriel to pre-order the Collector's Edition of Battlespire. He's confirmed to have not been an apprentice, so take your fan theories elsewhere. Oh, and a Daedric Crescent. Yeah, you never get to use it in Battlespire. It only appears on the cover art, in the intro cutscene, and on the loading screens. It is weird for a fantasy RPG to brandish a specific weapon on the cover, only to never actually have it appear in game. For whatever reason, a good few minor characters from this game reappear in ESO, but since it's ESO, I don't care. So, what are my concluding thoughts on Battlespire? It's an okay game. It's hard to get into and it has a lot of design problems, but it's one of those games that lets you go ham with overpowered builds and items if you know what you're doing. And to an extent, if you're lucky. Problem is, you can never escape all the issues this game has. From the subpar combat, to the lack of creative options for gameplay, to the abysmal UI. It's not the worst game I've played on this channel, Thief 4 is miles worse, but between the issues I've talked about and how annoying this game could be to record or play at times, I formed a slightly personal grudge against it in some ways. Is it the worst Elder Scrolls game? Well, I've never played Arena, Red Guard, Shadow Key, or any of the other spin-offs nobody really cares about, so I can't give you that judgment. It's tied with Oblivion in terms of quality for me. There's a lot I hate about both this game and Oblivion, and some things I quite like about them. I guess Battlespire has a leg up in that its leveling system is actually functional and there's actually some oomph to your attacks in combat, and it has teleportation magic. But it doesn't have an open world, a lot of stats are meaningless, and there's more in the way of cryptic gameplay aspects than probably any other entry into franchise. Oh, and Battlespire has spears and crossbows. It's not that cool though. Spears are just long blades and crossbows are significantly weaker bows. If you're big into this franchise like I am, yeah, Battlespire's worth a go. It'd be especially worth a try if your favorite game happens to be Daggerfall, since it takes after Daggerfall the most. You really ought to be aware of what you're in for though. It's a linear dungeon crawler adventure with the same signature Bethesda uber jank as any of their open world games. Depending on how obsessed with the franchise you are, you may want to play it simply for all the important lore introduced alone. As stated, much earlier on, you can easily acquire this game on GOG for 6 bucks. It runs out of box, but I hope you don't mind the fact that it uses DOS box. No pun intended. No source ports are available as of making this video, so it's all we have. Of all the games in the franchise, I think this is the one that deserves a remaster or at least a reimagining the most. This is because I'd much rather Daggerfall or Morrowind not get the remaster treatment, but that's a me thing. A spiritual successor would be nice too. It could be fun to play this game with modernized visuals, better UI, and generally honed edges. Elder Scrolls has a pretty dedicated modding community, but they instead choose to use the Skyrim engine to recreate Morrowind. Weirds me out. I think a modernized take on Battlespire, or at least something inspired by it, is an untapped goldmine for modders. That's all for today. For the very few of you who have followed my channel up to this point, apologies for the long delay. This video simply took ages to create, mostly due to a mix of classes, laziness, and this video's apparent girth. Really stretching that 10 minute mark, huh? I'll try and make an upload the next video before the end of December. Tune in next time for what will likely be a boomer shooter has become lost to time. Goodbye, man flesh. You'll leave now before more mistakes are made. And with this power, I may now rid myself of your irksome stink. But what? Oh! Ah, God!